And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the dr drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers to the temple, coming to us straight from SHM Publishing, the creators of Savage Company, which is now going into its Machines of War expansion. We'll get into that. We have on one co on one corner the man who the man who is asking why we are still here. Good bro the good brother Owen Martin, and on the other and on the other corner we have the ge we have the gentleman of the group. Good brother Adam Martin, how you how you guys doing tonight? Great, doing really well. <laughs> Lo Thanks I love the intro, us. by the way. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you much. Um, I try and get as close as I can without doing something that's going to get me sued by the Buffer family. <laughs> they will sue you. <laughs> well, for, well, um, if I think I, I think I can get away with by by just having a request that if I if I'm to be sued, I request that I request that the court take place in the middle of a forest outdoors. In in Duluth, tree court, tree court. I no. mean, I would just I... prefer that, the, that there you get a cut of the pay per view from the court proceedings. No, I'm no, I'm saying have have their lawyers um go into their opening <laughs> arguments while when it's when it's negative seven below. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah, but you you know that if if you get sued by the Buffer family, one it will be very loud, and two it will be on pay per view. So if you can just get a cut of that, it doesn't matter if you lose, you'll still get paid. That's your yeah. series right. Sportsman way. <laughs> our Shit. our motto has always been since we started, you know, publishing things, we are so not getting sued. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so we're very careful to make all of our things different enough. <laughs> if it's inspired by something, it has to be different enough and have an original take because we are, we so, are not. so not getting sued. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a tradition to start around here to start with the humble beginnings. And taking that into account, talk to me about you about your guys' first introduction to role playing games and what it what was it that made it um, stick? <laughs> okay. This is a great story and Adam you should tell it. Okay. So uh Owen's introduction to role-playing games was a little bit earlier than mine. He's the older brother. Mm -hmm. uh, my introduction was actually in a game that he was playing in. Uh, it was DM'd by our friend Josh, and I actually still game with him to this day. Uh, so that was probably, what, 15 years ago, I think. It was a year before you went in the military. So yeah, what... I, was a, I was a teenager and trying to get out of my mom's house, and he lived on his own and stuff. So, yeah, uh, we started playing... Uh, three point five, uh, mm -hmm. when it was like the new hotness, um, and uh, there the DM let us kind of get away with a lot of stuff. He was very adversarial, but he was also very like uh, open to creativity. Yeah, he was permissive of whatever you want to do because anything that he allows you to do in the game, he's going to do it worse. Um, <laughs> you weren't, he was a munchkin dm so you weren't going to out munchkin him anyway mm -hmm. so i had never played before i didn't really know what was what was good ideas and what was bad ideas and uh i i wanted to be a, a big smashy guy so he let me play this half work that i named sledrick the entertainer <laughs> sledrick the entertainer carried around a 26 foot long hammer Black hole. Well, flagpole. Flagpole <laughs> attached to a boulder that <laughs> was in the shape of a hammer. He liked to tell people that the boulder was his father because it like was it sheltered him and it was his safety net when he was growing up abandoned in the hillsides. So whatever. he impaled his own father. No, no, he just uh, he just bolted it to this to the pole. He put a handle on it. Uh, anyway, so it was it was like a thousand pounds. I think it was like right at my maximum lift and carry weight for my <laughs> fighter bar. You were multi class. Yeah, you were, you were all strength build. <laughs> you were do, you were you were multi classing in three point five. I I would say I feel sorry for you, but just but this was your idea, so no simpy from me. <laughs> I think it was just like a, a dip. In 
fighter just to get some feats or something. Well, but, uh, that's, that's what that's what that's what fighter is. that's what fighter is. If if, if, I, if I, everybody everybody takes fighter around for a spin. If a, if the fighter class in three point five was a car, it'd be a four door Ford whore. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, so it, I put I put strap handles on this thing, and he would like lift it just barely off the ground, and then kind of shuffle around with it. Like that was my that was like first introduction to the party was me like carrying this thing around. I'd leave it from town to town. Yeah, I'd leave it in the middle of town so that I could go into shops and stuff. No one's gonna mess with it. They just think they it's can't a, pick it up. Like what are they new, gonna do? New flagpole flag or something. <laughs> and the only way that I could wield it is to like in, use enlarge person on myself mm -hmm. to get big enough to where I could barely pick it up and like swing it with a bunch of penalties many many feats and penalties to wield oversized weapons because you know that's a thing yeah. so, that's how 3.5 worked yeah <laughs> yeah um, it was worth it for the damage <laughs> yeah it was it was crazy amounts of damage that was really fun um yeah and i would like you know knock the roofs off of buildings and just make clearings in the forest trying to find a single goblin just knock down all the trees um yeah it was great fun uh but he thought he was a comedian that was why he had that name. And I went in, we went into a tavern one time and I decided you had to one use, point to perform comedy which I decided to use total roll, score of negative 1. Yeah, I decided to use perf <laughs> perform my perform comedy skill with my negative 1 total modifier because I was trained in it. Uh rolled really badly. Nobody was laughing. So I just switched to intimidate. And got like a nat 20 on that. I was really good at Intimidate. <laughs> so then everybody gave me money. I was like, yeah, I'm really good at comedy shows. Well, my favorite part, though, is the fact that every week you had a different horrible joke. And then the, you well, would perform these taverns in character throughout the entire, the, the entire scene. You do it in character and you do stand up in character as Celedric and tell very bad jokes. Well, it wasn't just bad jokes. It was also anachronistic jokes. So I would tell jokes about like the difference of people from New York and New Jersey. And we're in this <laughs> fantasy world where nobody knows what the hell I'm talking about at all. Uh, and it was like bad stand up about that stuff too. So it was, I don't know. <laughs> I remember the shark joke and that's it. Like that one will just be stuck with me forever. <laughs> the shark yes. joke. Yeah. It's, it's, it opens like, uh, like there's, there's so many unprovoked shark attacks uh every year it's like what's a provoked shark attack is there somebody from jersey out here like punching sharks or something that's some yeah. seinfeld ass shit there yeah it's terrible terrible it's terrible best. terrible stand-up bits <laughs> intentionally bad yeah <laughs> but everybody remembers sledrick to this day like there are people that remember sledrick because <laughs> it was it was just so ridiculous he didn't wear armor either he wore like a he wore like a like a, was it like a bondage suit? It was like just straps. Just straps. It was just leather straps with just like so studs on them. Your, yeah, just so you could. So it, it counted. Hammer. It counted as as studded leather armor, but it wasn't like covering hardly anything. That puts some terrifying mental images. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I remember. I remember in character role playing, ripping my own eye out so that I could get a prestige class that was just for orcs. I have grooms. Yeah. Uh, it was good time. Yeah. Yeah, legendary. And it's not something that I can pass judgment on given how many times I've had to tell the story of the um of the trap of the rogue who was obsessed with traps who created who created a up button. The what? The up button. It was a tr it was a runic trap he made. You step you step on what you step on the trigger, you go up. <laughs> if you want if you want to be anal about it, it you're you are treated as if you casted fly on yourself for four seconds going straight up at forty miles an hour. That's fantastic. <laughs> I love it. The thing is, I for, I forgot to put in some caveat about what happens if you hit a wall. <laughs> and the DM des decided to go. Like well, you you still have to keep moving in that direction, no matter what's in the way. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> Not just hit it and do damage. No, you just keep going through the wall. No, you're, it's 
it was it's treated it's treated as crushing damage like you're being pressed yeah um, that that's still very bad <laughs> yeah. so so it's 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 less like a it's less like a fly spell and more like a pillar just shoves you up from the ground and if there's yeah. something in the way you get sandwiched yeah and what ended up ha what ended up happening was at the end of that campaign we end up fighting a dragon dragon takes one slight step forward and, and then I ask What's he? Wh where did he step? Uh, right there. That's where my trap is. Yeah, but it's a dragon. He's too heavy. I. It doesn't say that. It just says you go. You go up if you step. If you step on it, it doesn't matter if you're fi five five pounds or five hundred pounds. That and seems like, like some some really useful video game thing. <laughs> like you just throw down this. You just throw down the bouncy pad, and it just launches you wherever you want to go. Yeah, take full advantage of that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this castle's in the way. You. <laughs> well, um, I have I have gone with the, I um the whole the whole reason I ended up the whole reason I ended up do, ended up wanting to do the, wanting to do it is because I was sick of I was sick of playing rogues who were, um who were thief who were thieving and backstabbing and that was their main shtick. I um mm -hmm. I specifically said I wanted. I wanted in, I wanted D and D meets Wiley e. Coyote. <laughs> that was that so was what I that was what I asked the GM to help me make. So you were making like Acme traps. Yeah. Did you ever put a portable hole on the wall and like make the tunnel go into it or something? Um, <laughs> I did. I did thinking with I beat I beat um thinking with portals by about a by about a few years. <laughs> you know, portable hole in the wall, portable hole in the ceiling. Yeah. Then take one of them away, and then treat it as if they have, as if they were doing falling damage at terminal velocity. <laughs> um, we used to, uh, we used to get into a lot of trouble with ring gates. And think <laughs> up and and think oh, of worse God. ways to get in trouble with ring. So gates. many ways to get in trouble. Oh, I gosh. I will rate I will raise you one because this has been a meme for years about why engineers should not play D and D. The <laughs> have you ever heard of the arrow of total destruction? Oh yes, we oh, yeah. know all about it. Everyone's yep. heard of that. They was, nerfed that for a Pathfinder, though. Yeah, I was only oh, able to use it yeah. once, but I made sure it got its use. Um, yeah, we were more fond of of the the three point five chicanery mm -hmm. of the wizard's nuke. Are you aware of that? <laughs> yeah, Ye old wizard's nuke. <laughs> Although that's, uh, where you, that's where you take a hundred page spell book and write explosive runes on every page. <laughs> Both sides of each page. And then you just cast burn it. <laughs> spell magic and then you, you know, choose to fail, mm -hmm. which is an option. <laughs> and then they all go off at once. Yes. <laughs> it's a horrible, horrible <laughs> thing. And it is one hundred percent totally allowed by raw. Yeah, it's <laughs> the I find I find that the most fun that happens with RPGs is when you find and exploit what can be professionally referred to as dumb shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whether it be do. whether it be Woo. that or um, ridiculous or cre or creating a muscle wizard because some because somebody wanted to cast spells with the power of flexing. Yes. Excellent. I love a good I love a good muscle wizard or a strong rogue. Strong rogue and muscle wizard. Some um, of our favorites. Yes. I've had many GMs wish death on me because of the fact that I kept making sore saladins. <laughs> sore I mean, it makes sense. Like, why wouldn't you? Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Appa apparently, uh, apparently, it's haram to make sorcerer paladin multi classes, even though they work like, like white on fucking rice. Yeah, there's, like the yes. same ability dependent. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, go for it. Yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> like uh like uh monk druids wild shape and flurry of blows <laughs> um i've done i've no done, reason not I, to. I have why, done why the, wouldn't this bear no kung fu i have done that <laughs> at high at high levels so that you so that you have a bear going full fist of the north star yes why yeah. not yeah um <laughs> I I abused bull rush feats with wild shape and and did a charging arm did a um dire charging armadillo Nice. Um, yeah. You know, so that when so that when he hits somebody with the first bull rush, it's a case of, well, he's still got movement left, so he's just gonna keep going. 
we never actually got to play it, but we did talk a lot about uh, doing a whole party of uh, goblins with the what's that? What's that thing? Beastmaster well, or something? We only they, need one. Where they get giant mammoth rider? Mammoth rider, yeah. We only need one goblin it. mammoth rider. Everybody else needs to be uh, siege gunners so that they can mount the cannons on top of the elephant. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I had one case where I abused I abused meta magic feats because somebody was saying that uh, magic missile is is useless. So I ended up. I ended up coming oh, up with no. a feat combo so that I was throw so that in a single turn I was throwing out 128 magic missiles. <laughs> yep, I believe it. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not, definitely not useless. And they can't fail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they can't fail, and it's force damage. They, um, they, there's no DR for it, mm -hmm. and it, there's no missing. Like yeah. you're taking all of that damage. Each one's not a lot of damage, but you're taking it all. Mm -hmm. But Give now, given that that bring it's um it's interesting that you that Adam you mentioned I'm um, going into service because I seem because I get the feeling with something like Savage Company that's where it's be where it's gotten at, much like with um Battle Lords who I've pre who I've had the dev developers on um here previously I get the feeling that's that's been one audience that's take that's taken to this kind of game kind of setting. Yeah, it's definitely not exclusive mm -hmm. to that audience, but it's yeah. it's a major part of our following. It's also that's, part of our like writing base too. Like we've got several. Our heart is. Yeah, yeah, um, and it, I feel like a, a lot of the stuff that we've put into Savage Company is is things that you could only get from drawing on the vet community. So mm -hmm. um, it's it's really cool. Like we we take every opportunity we can to adapt people's real personal stories and tweak them so that they fit in our world uh with their permission of course and uh and put those into the book um so there's there's several of those short stories that are adapted from like real life yeah we have an open call we talk to all of our veteran friends and say hey if you have a story you want to tell based on your personal experience or a story you heard while you were in the military or something that you thought of like we want to put you in our book mm -hmm. like write it down or tell us about it and you know we'll take it and work it into the book so that way you can get published and we give them full credit and everything mm -hmm. and to the to the, to that particular end is that kind is that kind of how is that kind of how savage company got the idea for it got started of just you of just you guys were you have a lot of um <laughs> A lot of players in the vet in the veteran community who who played and um and that and things just went, things just spiraled out from there. Well, it was the, that sillier than that. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. The> <laughs> oh, of started, course it was. <laughs> the way it started was I was living in New Hampshire at the time, and I flew down for our grandfather's funeral um, in 2009. Was it nine or was it two, wait not 2009 2017? Yeah, that sounds right. 2017. So 20, 2017, I flew down to Arkansas and stayed at my brother's, stayed at Adam's house. Um, we, we did the funeral and everything. And then I was I ended up there for an extra week before my return trip home. So because I had booked the tickets way early because we did not know what the plans were when I booked them. Um, so I was there for a week. And I was like, hey, I haven't had been able to play any D&D &D for like three years in New Hampshire. I, haven't, I don't have a group or anything. I'm like, let's get a game together. So we called the boys, see who was available. And it was, you know, Adam and I and then two well, of our friends. You were, you were hanging out here. And then I think one of, one of our friends... Uh, Brian like showed up or he was hanging out here at the same time and then we were like hey we almost could get a game together we, so one we, more person. We, we started figuring out who was who was close and who was available in, and then I called uh, Dave who lives two Dave blocks was... away and <laughs> yeah. had not played in 10 years but he was down <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the idea was we were just going to play a one shot and yeah. we wanted to play something fun but ridiculous and we were like lol orcs with guns like oh, hey. Also, also keep in mind, I'd never played Pathfinder before. I'd only played 3.5. <laughs> I'm looking through the Pathfinder books. I'm like, wait, I can play 
an actual orc now, not just a half orc. They're like, yeah. And I'm like, all right, let's do this. Let's be green skins. <laughs> and then Adam's like, I want to play a gunslinger. And I'm looking through the stuff and I'm like, dude, let's all just be orcs and guns and stuff. <laughs> and and <laughs> it's everybody was on board. And and Brian, who was DMing, was like, all right, I'll put something together. And, <laughs> and he, and he just kind of hobbled, cobbled something together. We played it, you know, within the, we started playing it that that night within an hour of mm -hmm. figuring out what we were going to do. And uh, that was we had so much fun. Then, like later, I was like, "Hey, it was, it was the next day," and I was like, "Hey, do you guys want to play again tonight?" <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and like you know, and like I hadn't been in town for like a year, so there was like, "Oh, uh, we can make time." And so we, we got together the next night and played again. I'm like, oh, man, that was great. Such a good time. And then I got home and I was like, hey, what if what if we did this every Thursday and I just like teleconferenced into the living room? And I was like, <laughs> sure. OK, yeah. <laughs> You so were like we you were like ordering you were like ordering webcams for us and microphones yeah, and shipping microphone. those over yeah. so we could get them up yeah <laughs> and, and and so we just started playing orcs and guns every Thursday and we did that for you know three four years and yeah, where we would trade we, we would write stuff because there was a lot of material content that didn't exist. Yeah. So we would need things for our stories and then we would write them. And I tried my best to write stuff down in notes, like someplace or not just in our game, but we're, you know, written down somewhere. So we're like, we could maybe do something in the future with it. We talked about it a lot mm -hmm. about maybe doing a book someday. And everybody talks about, Oh, I'm going to write a book someday. Yeah. We and had to then, homebrew a lot of, you know, items and classes and stuff like that and then we would we would all take turns dming too so it was kind of episodic and great. uh and savage company was originally like the name of our group like well, we were like yeah. oh yeah we're orc mercenaries that's why we have guns and stuff and so we had like made up a backstory for soldiers mm -hmm. now turn mercenary building a city in the desert hiring out to for the to to, to do fighting for money what yeah. happened to your what happened to your modified a team speech <laughs> I have it somewhere. I don't know. Man. Wait, yeah. modified A team speech, really? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just our it's just our game, you know. Like you know, we just do whatever. So. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and then you yeah. start making vehicles and stuff as well. We just we just we just kept adding things to the world and to the lore, and uh, we like the first few sessions we like saved this little this little made up town. Uh, in the middle of the desert um and like one of those it's like those npcs that people like you know pull out of their butt and the whole party gets attached to them so we just kept coming back to that town every time we would go off on missions we would be like oh let's go back to our home base where there's all these townsfolk that we saved from being murdered by demons and we can go uh you know hang out with those guys and spend our money and stuff um so yeah it all just it all just kind of grew from our home games yeah yeah and and it was always the well maybe someday we'll write a book or let's write that down for when we write a book and then i think it was in spring of 2019 i was like all right look let's do this for serious for real and let's actually do something yeah. so then we started working on it for real in the spring of 2019 and then we launched our kickstarter in the end of 2019 for the first book and then that book came out in March of 2020 and all of from 2020 to now we've released 12 books. This, this Kickstarter is the 12th one, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's been a very steep learning curve. <laughs> we've had to adapt a lot, uh, um, you know, starting, starting as we did with, with such a large project and knowing so little about publication. Um, so yeah um we've had a, we've had a lot of support from our fans uh the kickstarter the first kickstarter was was way more successful than we thought it was going to be it was it, it blew up um from our point of view like other kickstarters probably think it's kind of you know small time mm -hmm. but uh it was really big for us it's i uh... um 
that do, that does bring me to into one thing I was I was going to ask you about what some of the big um learning experiences you've had since set since setting up the whole project. Oh yeah, mostly everything to do with publishing. <laughs> it's a it's a lot of work and it's all been learning on our feet as we go. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Um but I mean, honestly, we had we, we got really lucky that we were able to uh, meet and partner up with uh, Troy Daniels, mm -hmm. who has been in the industry for decades, I think. Um, and he does our layout and and answers all of our crazy questions. So uh, he's helped us stay on track and not make mistakes. Probably a lot of early publishers make Um and it's it's he's been a huge help, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, like make us. I tell him, he, like say he he makes us look professional because he you know puts all the words and pictures on the page, um, and 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 it, you know is there to answer any questions. So uh, he's yeah he's been a huge help. But um, but yeah, mm -hmm. just any every everything to publishing because like we do everything ourselves, like every bit, mm -hmm. like hot write everything and hire artists and stuff and like you know and like we do a lot of research to try to st structure things in a way that looks professional and like our goal has always been to like we we aspire to be at least as good as first party products like official pathfinder official D, &D stuff that's that's where that's where the goal is if it if it looks at least that professional then 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 we're happy with it yeah um you know which is i mean is not easy to do because we're two guys with zero dollars of budget and trying to figure all this up as we mm -hmm. go so <laughs> now it the way you guys describe it it, so, it sounds like the whole the whole thing start the whole thing um traces it's the majority of its roots to pathfinder now mm -hmm. obviously I can kind I can kind of infer some guesses as to as to what prompted um do the idea of doing both Pathfinder and D and D five e but what I am but honestly that wouldn't be as interesting of a uh, interesting of a story relatively what a more what I am curious about and what I do want to ask about is the the um is some of the pitfalls that you that you may have had or dodged when it comes to trying to juggle two very distinctly separate um, systems at once. Okay. That is not as hard as you might think. Um, we write mm -hmm. everything for Pathfinder mm -hmm. and lock that in and it's done. Then after all that's written, then we can kind of switch modes and look at 5e and look at how is the spirit of this translated into 5e rules? And so when we write it originally, we have zero concern for 5th edition whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And we just do it how we think it's best done and how we like it. And then after that, that then we go and correct. look at it and translate it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If if we if we know something is going to cause a pitfall when it's in 5e, we, we might take that into consideration. But but I don't know 5e hardly at all. Um, you've had Owen's had to learn more 5e um, in doing some of the conversions. Um, but what we know and what we write for is Pathfinder and going from a rules heavy to a rules lighter system like is a is a natural, generally easy. it's a natural yeah. conversion process. Um, So, yeah, that yeah. that was a that was a hang up at first because we uh you know we wanted to go for we wanted to get a conversion into five e but we didn't know it so uh you know we had to hire some folks and you know had some ups and downs with that and uh, now we have people that are part of the team and that can help us do that like concurrently we have, we have friends who are going to help us make sure that yeah that it that it comes yeah. out good <laughs> and, then, and then owen and then owen's kind of branched out and and started learning that stuff as well so that i've i started uh, yeah end of November, on. a crash course heavy into con 5e conversion yeah so uh it's not great it's not perfect we're actually going to release a revision to the 5e book an updated version here soon um it did come out with a few typos so we're gonna update that and then re-release it um mm -hmm. 
and anybody who got, bought it already gets it for free. Um, so it's just going to update the files and everything. But uh, then for this next book, uh, we're writing everything in Pathfinder. And then uh, if we have notes for the conversion, like if we have, if I have an idea how I want to convert it, I'll just put the notes down uh, right next to it. And then we're going to write everything in Pathfinder and then immediately do all of the conversion in one block. And then, uh, and then do layout for both books because mm -hmm. there'll be two separate books. Yep. So, um, but yeah, it's much easier to go from Pathfinder to Five E. So much easier. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it would be it would be hard to add granularity, but stripping it out is not 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 that difficult. Yep. And really, I don't care if it changes. If things change drastically, I don't mind if they change, so long as the spirit is there and mm -hmm. it is a good thing to play. Like if it is fun to play and has the same you know general spirit an intention then that's what matters it doesn't right. need to be the exact thing converted the classes change a lot and that's fine because the things that they change to are fun and mm -hmm. interesting yeah. and preserve the attitude and spirit of the original even if they're not really the same thing anymore it kept it kept the flavor that we were trying to add and also the the whole the purpose of adding classes is to is to expand options to give players and in gms like more tools to work with mm -hmm. without any one being like superior to everything that's out there or right that's being, a big thing is like we're being pointless know. dead ends you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's this other thing is like our stuff is all designed not to be balanced to itself but to be balanced to first party content so we want our classes to be more options not better options and the same thing when they get into 5e, there's different things that exist in that ecosystem. So they some things get cut out, or some things like some things we write to fill a hole in Pathfinder don't need to be in 5e because that hole doesn't need to be filled. Like mm -hmm. a specific uh, NPC class for crafting without being a spellcaster, like doesn't need to exist in 5e because you don't craft things. <laughs> so um yeah so it, it can change a lot we don't need to go one-to-one -one conversion we need to preserve all of the utility and the spirit rather so yeah. and of course still be in line with 5e's power levels we want to balance through existing things to provide more options not necessarily better options mm -hmm. and <clears throat> in <clears throat> sorry in my defense, when it comes when it comes to the, when it comes to the whole conversion thing, um, I one of my early experiences with with dealing with multi system books was the um, second edition books of Legend of the Five Rings, which nobody likes talking about. <laughs> <laughs> where they tr where they tried to incorporate both the um, three point five D twenty system at because it was the style at the time, right, right, and the roll and keep system that let that legend of the five rings has used since day one right well so that's another thing that's why we didn't combine anything that we we did a full complete pathfinder book mm -hmm. and then we changed then we converted that and did a whole separate book they're two different books definitely um that they have the core spirit and, all, and some of the things are the same like guns are the same the races are, aren't the same but they have the same names and pictures and <laughs> but um but but they're two completely separate books mm -hmm. and they can be fully committed to what they are individually mm -hmm. now obviously both D D and pathfinder are fantasy games which is probably the least controversial thing i will say tonight <laughs> but the reason I bring that up is because you guys are introdu you guys were introducing a new tech level into the into that sandbox. And I'm curious what I'm curious what some of the things you wanted to try and avoid when it comes to the idea of putting guns in a fantasy setting. Okay. So, genre good. is a very question. interesting subject. So, mm -hmm. because it's hard to nail down what our books are, uh, I like to say they are military fantasy. Yes, because they they strongly are strongly diesel punk flavored. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, diesel punk military fantasy. But mm-hmm. so here's the thing is that we it's designed to work with your existing worlds. We have our own kind of world, but it's designed to be plugged into your existing game world as well, if that's something you want to do. Or if you want to take just certain elements of it and add it to your game and not others. That's all within the scope of intended play styles. Um, so we have wizards and swords and dragons and stuff. And then not everybody has access to magic. So we've got a bunch of orcs in a, in a desert where magic doesn't work very good. Building tech that doesn't use magic. So it is not... Uh, it's not a technology chain escalating upwards. It is a side branch. So now you have wizards and magic, and you have orcs and gunpowder. A and, differently developed pocket. Mm-hmm. And you've got things that blend all between. Yeah, and, and Pathfinder specifically has been pretty famous for its huge variance in <laughs> genre tone. There's a so, country every different type of Upsetting. right yeah mm-hmm. yeah and and you mentioned tech levels and in some ways yes our we've made more modernized firearms uh but in other ways like there are things that are much more advanced tech wise that we that we didn't bring in or th- or things that we kind of uh wrote alongside of those things like there's a bunch of like crashed spaceship tech level stuff in uh, you know, Pathfinder cannon. Uh, so, electronics, and we don't have any. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, laser guns and spaceships and stuff like that. Um, in in certain books that I'm sure a lot of Pathfinder GMs don't like to think about at all. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> we don't get any, we don't get anywhere close to that stuff. Um, this is the actual evolution of where things would go in the absence of magic, right? Mm-hmm. And, and there are some more advanced firearms that were written for Pathfinder already. Um, uh, and some of those were very specific to an Historic. adventure path, and they were written for a very specific, like, they were tied to a time in the real world. Um, so we moved away from that stuff, and we're writing for how would, how would tech advance from its early firearm stuff in Pathfinder world and how would that slightly modify over time to bring us up to you know just a little bit more advanced firearms that are still balanced with everything else in the setting and, and also how would this stuff advance in a world that does have magic uh so you know we have things that are combinations of you know we're minor magic items that have some magic but are also you know more slightly more technologically advanced right the other we're thing u- that also we're using nice magic that- using magic to build technology that the technology itself is not magical. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, the other nice thing about it, though, is that we're completely divorced from any historical timeline. So yeah. actual history, real world history doesn't matter. We're not tied to that. We can introduce different things on our own, our own, you know, sort of internal timeline that's completely separate from that. So, um, you know, it doesn't, we're not, we're not, constrained to be historically accurate because right. this is an imaginary world where dragons and wizards exist so it, things are it, not uh, <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't matter if it doesn't matter if in the real world this piece of technology came a hundred years after that piece of technology because we're in a different world and it could have advanced in the opposite way or something yeah we just still don't have radios like radios aren't a thing mm-hmm. <laughs> Because magical communication is easy and cheap, so why would people even need yeah. that? Um, it just never yeah. would happen. Yeah. That's, and that, that's kind of one of the things that we've avoided, is we don't like carbon copy specific tech things. We always make up our own stuff, and sometimes it's reminiscent of things that you see in the real world, you know, like the machine parts and stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, all of it is is just designed and manufactured whole cloth however we want it um so we get we get our own unique feel and our our awesome artist team has like done a really good job (laughs) of of writing that dictionary the visual dictionary of how savage coast stuff looks Mm -hmm. and that brings me that brings me obviously towards the towards your latest project machines of war now Yes. 
as some as somebody who has had to endure the deluge of white noise of ta- of what of whether or not tanks are better than are better than mechs, um, large, largely from people largely from people who apparently need to stroke their damn egos, um, <laughs> and give and given the uh, something that I'm curious about is do is um before this was was the idea of throwing in diesel punk mechs something that was brought brought up by your community or what or um, was there a different route to this idea of bringing max into the table <laughs> it's 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 come from more of our own homebrew games like that's that's just something that like go ahead go out you know what like, go ahead in in under five minutes tell them about <laughs> played in we we're playing eberron another game with brian that he was dming he loves eberron um mm-hmm. i think his mom got him into it and he you know eberron eberron. Has... he does not like it anymore no, we killed it. Um, so Everon, <laughs> Everon has you know Warforged, which we thought were badass. Uh, Everon has these lightning trains, which were you know kind of cool, but they were very locked down and they didn't do very much. So in our homebrew game of Everon, where we got away with a whole bunch of stuff we probably shouldn't have, we hijacked a train. We had a Warforged artificer uh, who. Uh, bent a lot of the mechanic rules on how Warforged Artificers work, probably. Um, and <laughs> basically had his own Iron Man base in space and started ripping apart these lightning trains and harnessing elementals to make us our own, like, uh, Power Rangers-esque Megazord transforming lightning train. <laughs> so it would, like, it would pop out legs and arms and go walking around and shooting magma cannons at people and stuff like that. So, like, we know that it's a thing that players want to do because we're players and we we wanted wanted to to do that. So... And I don't think it's more of a point. I don't think it's the argument that should be made is that tanks or walking tanks or mechs are better. It's what's cooler. Right. Well, also... (laughs) And a lot of time... Max are cooler. We have both. Yeah. So you don't have to pick one or the other. They're both in the new book. Both mm-hmm. tanks and walking tanks are all in the new book. So yeah. so you have all of that. So everything's on the table. You don't have to argue about it. You get to play whatever you want. Um, but uh, part of so so we we did do mechs before um, in one of our own games, and that was fun because we fought you know equally tall giant demons. As and, one does. And blow for blow against giant monsters with our with our uh transformer train. And and that was fun. Um and that was very Power Ranger Megazord style because everybody's in the same cockpit and uh different people had different stations and were making roles to do different things. And um, you know, it was it was it was fun, it was its own thing, and we wrote the mechanics to do that so that we could do it, and we had a lot of fun with it. Um for Machines of War. Uh, that was a big inspiration, but also part of the inspiration was, um, we know a lot of people that do a lot of different war games and they were interested in Savage Company and they don't play Pathfinder or D and D and they, they're, they're big fans. They're like, man, we like, we love all of this. And I'm like, well, I'm making something for you. And this is what I'm thinking about doing. And they were super on board for it. And so, um, you know, that's that that influence as well. And then I also have these like half remembered experiences of playing Battletech with my friends Mm -hmm. while drinking in 1999. And um, and and I remember it being super fun. And then I look at the rules now and I'm like, man, this is quite dense. I could not play this on my own. I would need somebody who already knows how to play it with me. And, um, and, and, and that was a big inspiration for, well, let's write our own rules for a tabletop war game. That is extremely easy to pick up and easy to play. And I know how in my head, I'm like, Oh, if I do numbers like this, it doesn't mean anything different on the war game. But then I can do things like move a decimal two places, and now it's the numbers match what you the numbers you would find on your tabletop RPG. Mm-hmm. So I can make it where 
we have this war game that plays quickly and easily and fast and is fun. And then we can jump from playing Pathfinder, playing D&D with our regular guys, and then jump into mechs and now play war game scale in a fast-paced, large-scale combat and then jump right back to being at character scale. And it'll be easy and smooth and fluid because all the numbers line up together. And I can... Well, it just spirals into more depth from there with uh, customization and uh, piloting skill and all this other stuff. But yeah, ease, ease of use, but not a lack of depth. Yeah. <laughs> so we were, started working on that. Well, really, I just let it percolate in the back of my brain for like six to eight months because we had all these other books to get out as part of our Kickstarter because I was thinking about this before we even released the first book, the campaign setting book. And I, and I was telling Adam about it. I'm like, all right, we just write down the notes and come back to this later because we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> we, do that, we do that a lot where we'll get together and we'll start riffing over some idea and we'll be like, we can't be thinking about this yet. We, we still have really. to finish these other 10 ideas that we just, have on the table. We need to write, write down everything we just said and just we'll back burner that for when we have, when we have time to, to bring it into the but production. also having ideas for the future is good because then we can sprinkle things in to other books like when the uh, operations guide. Okay. So back up mm -hmm. first Kickstarter, we ran this, you know, it ended in December of 2019 and one of the stretch goals was we'll write a few adventures for you, write a few adventures. It so was like one play. sentence afterthought. Right. Yeah. It just, yeah, it was like, yeah, one, two sentences in one of the stretch goals. We'll write some adventures. That's all we said. We'll write some adventures for you guys. So you have something pre written to play with these new rules in our setting, which yeah. is great because it's a great way to get into the game. Um, so we're like, all right, we got to write these adventures. So we started thinking about it and writing stuff or whatever. Well, well, as we were, as we were wrapping up the, the production of the main book, we realized that it wasn't going to, that stuff wasn't going to fit in there. We were at 250 pages. Right. We were going <laughs> to so, put, we we're going to put a beast theory in it and we we're going to add the Avengers. And we're like, we can't put like, all up in its own book. I mean, in, in our main book, our book's too big. So we need to split them off. Into so a separate since we promised yeah. adventures, we'll put the adventures in another book. We'll also put, you know, stat blocks for monsters and stuff in that book as well. We did like that 40 was, stat blocks. Uh, yeah, that was the idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we ended up writing six adventures and forty stat blocks, and then like a like a three or four page guide to creating Savage Company adventures. Like these are our internal rules for how we do it, and you know, in case you you know want help, here's some guidelines on how we do our own, and maybe this will give you ideas for your own games um, and all this stuff. And we put that into its own book called the Operations Guide, which ended up being another one hundred pages. <laughs> <laughs> and but what was cool about that was we were able to put things in like in that that we knew were coming up later like um oh yeah a couple Te of teasing archetypes and stuff go up because savage company is a, savage company is a mercenary group and so now we had in those adventures a couple of opposing mercenary groups show up in the adventures and then there's another thing in there that shows up from machines of war book and then uh, there's also uh, some uh, infantrymen was our big flagship class for the campaign setting, which is like, you know, a, 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 a gun soldier class. And we wrote infantrymen archetypes that ended up in the operations guide. So you could there were enemies that had archetypes that had not been previously published, but they fully explained all the things that they did in in their in their stat blocks. Um so and there was there was, there was one of those I think, um, but 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 they worked and it was in there and it had you know you weren't lost, but you just it just hadn't been published yet anywhere else. Um, and then later after we fulfilled all of our Kickstarter obligations, we wrote the Infantryman's Handbook, which has ten Infantryman archetypes in it, including the one that shows up in the Operations Guide. And then now with Machines of War. Um, the two factions that show up in the adventures are fully fleshed out and released in this next book. So it's, it, I think, I don't, I think it's cool, 
knowing what's going to be coming up ahead so that I can work it into the fabric of the other books because it's, you know, it's more of a complete world that mm -hmm. way. Now, putting aside the fact that um, one of the images on the Kickstarter page had a war machine and, and their pilots um, side by side to the point where I was wondering, was somebody playing Titanfall 2? <laughs> um, uh, well, we I played both of the Titanfalls, excuse me. <laughs> um there's there's a few things I'm curious about when it comes to mechs, especially given that some of my audience is big ass mech fans. Okay. Like I got one I got one guy who will always scream out mechs whenever something mech related shows up during the uh, during the live shows. All right, well let's get into it. I'm all about it. Okay. So, given the BattleTech influence can I assume that these are mechs more on the stompy end of things? These are bipedal tanks more than anything else. Well, yes. Uh, yes and no is maybe a better answer. Mm -hmm. So so here's the thing. Um, Battletech has its scale. Titanfall has its scale. Titanicus has its scale. And we're not con really constrained so much to any one layer because we're bringing out three classes or three size categories mm. of of mechs so the light war machines uh, are your titanfall size 25 foot tall mm -hmm. heavy war machines are really more battle tech scale 45 feet tall mm -hmm. and then the uh titanic war machines are more like mobile bases or mobile fortresses mad Cat. and well no mad cats maneuverable that's our our heavies are more like mad cat style um the 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 titanic war machines are more like a base with a lot of people in it a lot of fort it's a walking fort basically they don't move very fast and they're just would it, littered would guns it be more on would it be more on point to compare it to some to some of the heavier classes of um of titans not Titans no. as in Titans Fall, but Titans as in um, 40k Titans. Yeah, yeah, it's closer to that. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, they're yeah they're 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 huge. They're heavily armored, tons of guns, and they do not move very fast. Mm -hmm. They are more of a mo mobile bunker than they are an agile uh, vehicle. Yeah, and, and they're will, all designed I... to field it together mm -hmm. if you wanted to. If you wanted to play something a battle that big, you can field any combination of mm -hmm. of, of your three different sizes, and as well as mm -hmm. tanks, infantry units, support vehicles, different things like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that I'm guessing that um, well, for, first off, when you do, when you uh, describe when you describe the he when you describe the heavy ones, I was I was about to say, oh, a Steiner Scout Lance. <laughs> yes. um well okay so so yeah so so basically okay so that so just think of the heavies mm -hmm. as all your mech warrior style and your lights as your titanfall style mm -hmm. and and that's basically like the best way to imagine it with existing yeah. things uh they're all very different because each faction is extremely different mm -hmm. um because, okay, so like the Savage Company stuff is based on uh, like World War II American armor. So, you know, uh, heavy metal, hydraulics, grease, diesel engines, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, very much what you would expect from just a tank that moves, that, that walks. Um, and then other factions are, are very different, like the Invictus Legion, all of their, uh, war machines are marble golems so they're big walking statues they're colossuses that carry weapons mm -hmm. and uh uh have a spot for a pilot whether you know inside them the biggest one has like red tile roofing on it um you know very roman style architecture um so it would look like a roman statue that where that could move yeah, yeah, they're they're literally uh, they're literally walking combinations of statuary and architecture because they're carved from marble and animated. So 
that's very different from Battletech stuff, obviously. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, um, like the Brass Guild is is you know more steampunk esque. Yeah, they use a they use like a combination of clockwork and magic artificery. So um, they've got like magical engines that drive all their stuff, but it's all very heavy brass and wood cogs and stuff. You know, made by dwarves and gnomes. Dwarves and gnomes is the brass guild. Yeah, and then you know, and then uh, so there you have the uh, Malice Protectorate. Their stuff is very much. Uh, a dark mirror to the Savage Company stuff, where Savage Company stuff is diesel and heavy metal. Um, their stuff is Gothic. they're like the chaos version of Savage Company, really. Mm-hmm. So yeah, true. it's 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 black dark metal, metal. Chains, fire, spikes, and uh, they have they literally draw power from uh, imprisoned demons that are inside the core of the mech. So you know that that that, that's that's them, and they are very edgy. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And then the and then the elves is straight weird. They're high. They're high magic. So everything is 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 extremely magical, and and uh, there's no mechanics really going on whatsoever. So they're more esoteric. Mm. They're weird looking. uh, Interesting. but very different. So, like, but unfortunately, they're elves. They, right. they, you know, honestly, okay. So here's the thing: <laughs> we've talked about this before internally. So, uh, in the first book, if you've read it, uh, there's a character. Her name is Ali Shrek. Now, Ali Shrek has two things against her. One, she's a kobold. <laughs> two, she's two, a bard. She's a bard. <laughs> Oh so, <laughs> right. So the thing is, is like we somehow through the work of developing and working on this character and her story over and over again, she went from being annoying to being one of the most beloved characters in the book. Everybody loves Ali Shrek, and, uh, <laughs> and 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 so going into this book here uh, in the Machines War, one of my things was like, all right. I'm going to try to do for elves because I hate elves. Well, I also hate bards. Uh, I, I hate elves. I'm like, I'm going to try. My goal is to do for elves what we did for bards and kobolds and make it something that I would actually want to play. Mm. Make it something cool. And I think that we've succeeded. Mm-hmm. You won't know for a while because I don't have the official art yet finished yeah. yet and stuff. But, um, you know, we'll we'll see when it comes out. But I think that this take on elves, which is this, and, and like we're also doing revisiting dwarves as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not erasing anything that exists. We're not retconning anything. We're just adding some side options that fit our setting. Mm-hmm. So you can choose them if you wish, and you're not obligated to. So we're expanding, expanding on more. certain pieces yeah. of their of their lore and backstories. Expanding and some options in lore and not you know and the, but everything existing is still included. So um, I think that even you might want to play one of these elves. I think they're going to be very cool. Yeah. So and to be fair, <laughs> I, I'm not, I don't have anything against playing as elves. I'm just I just use that as a running gag. It is a running gag, but I also kind of agree with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but some something else that I'm something else that I'm curious that I'm curious about when it comes to when it comes to the mechs is um since we brought up um BattleTech slash Mech Warrior I'm I'm at, and this is I'd say this is partially answered because of the because of the artwork of the pilot class but I don't think you're gonna have to deal with um. Met with mechs having to wear the kind of outfits that a mech warrior would wear, which um is a bit of an oxymoron because they have to wear barely anything. <laughs> well, so uh, if if we're talking about interfacing with the tabletop RPG with Pathfinder mm-hmm. or Five E, um, anyone can pilot a war machine if they have some drive skill, the, um, the appropriate skill to pilot mm-hmm. that war machine. Right, if the which is ride or drive, whatever it is, if they have a piloting skill, if they're skilled in piloting or driving, they should be able to do it. 
the you shouldn't be your character should not be locked out of this whole chunk of content because you're good at driving at riding horses so you can't pilot mechs or something like that so um anybody with some decks or points into ride or drive they're the same thing by the way they're not there's not two different skills if you have drive or ride on your sheet that's the skill you use um if if you're moderately skilled you should be able to do it now the level of your skill affects how good you are at it but the point is that any character should be able to do to pilot a, a war machine mm -hmm. um, that was something that's very important to us because if you bring this into your existing game, you don't want to have, you know, half or some of your characters completely locked out of it and then have to find a way to hand wave them into it. Like they should be, able, you're, if you're a PC, you should be able to do it. Um, just some will be better than others. Yeah. And given, and given that now I am a survivor, let's say of attempting to play rifts over the years. <laughs> and and what I'm specifically focusing on in, on this is scale when it comes to combat. Because in stuff like Rifts or Cthulhu Tech or similar games, you have diff you have different layers of damage. Rifts' infamous mega damage is a classic example of this kind of thing. Um, when it comes to me when it comes to mechs. In combat, do you have some? Do you have something similar so so that is so that it's not a case of rolling an ass load of dice to determine da to determine damage against a mech versus against um versus against yeah. anything else? Yes. So there's there are several things happening there. One is that when um okay so so to start off, let's say you have just a weapon, one weapon, mm -hmm. and when you use that against another war machine, it has a damage line for that. And it's probably listed as like two or three. You do three damage points against another war machine. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to do those three damage points against a person, that would be 300 points of damage. However, the, the, the AW line is, is three. And then for the RPG section, you have an AP line, which is when using this weapon against personnel, and it's a totally different damage, which maybe it does an area with a saving throw. Mm -hmm. So, Because instead of doing it against a single target, you're doing it against a 30-foot hex. Mm -hmm. so, so that damage is spread out. Or... It may just do, um, you know, it, and, and that's usually the way it's going to go. Um, if I fire a rocket at another war machine, it's going to hit and do full damage. If I a rocket, I shoot a hex, and it does a different amount of damage to everyone in that hex, and they can save for half. And the savings based on the pilot skill, mm -hmm. and it's very simple. Um, and and that's what you would expect. So. It's not going to be a crazy amount of scale to where, oh, let's go fight this guy. Well, every time he shoots, he does 300 points of damage. Everyone's dead. It's not quite right. the same. <laughs> yeah, a war machine that's equipped to fight other war machines is, is not well adapted to attacking individual persons on the ground. Um, they can do it. It's just not what they're made for. And when you're crossing the scales like that, it, it also it's also kind of difficult the other way as well, because for those for your normal adventuring party to do damage against this giant war machine, like they have to do damage in the hundreds generally. Um, but you know, there are specific weapons that are that better suited to work against war machines well you can um, get it at war machine weapons like um you can also you get a have... fire rocket that does mm -hmm. one damage or points of damage instantly yeah, yeah and if, if everybody if everybody has one then that's a that's a pretty good it's a pretty good deal um and that's and that's how the squads work kind of like a squad of anti-war machine infantry um would just be a pack of dudes that all have rocket launchers. You move them around as one unit, uh, so they they occupy this thirty foot hex, mm -hmm. um, and then they're 
life points or whatever would be represented by the individual people in that unit. They have, yeah, they have 12 hit points and 12 health points because each one is representative of 100 points of hit points, right? They have 12 hip health points, and every time they lose a health point, their total damage is minus one. So at, at first, you're running 1d12 damage when you attack as that unit, but then if you're half hurt, you could be doing 1d12 minus six damage and yeah. you know drop below zero. So you could do none, but you could do a lot. So like they're dead, they're very squishy, but they're also extremely deadly. So, mm-hmm. like, you can't just ignore infantry. <laughs> which makes, which definitely makes sense. And does that answer? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. it very much does. Now, when it comes to, I've seen some. I've seen some attempts to bring to bring in mech, but they end up falling to the trap of having a bunch of chassis that they're not proud that they're proud of but not putting enough um, emphasis on customizing it, especially since we're dealing with effectively <laughs> mercenary companies with, with, within this particular setting. So obviously nobody's going to be running stock equipment. Well, actually, um, well, there, we have several, there's a few design philosophies here. Mm-hmm. One, no bad, no bad choices is, is, is a rule. So, all every faction well you know if we have our 15 base war machines right so we have five factions three three size categories for each um all of them have their stock equipment like off the shelf listing mm-hmm. um which i i actually expect a lot of people will probably play those as as a as a if you want to do a quick game mm-hmm. you versus a friend it's easy to grab them and play and have fun. Um, so, and like, like there's you know, none of them are really bad choices. They all offer different advantages or disadvantages. Um, and then you can customize it and get into deep customization and hand selection of equipment and do all this different stuff. And some of that is in the war machine aspect. And then if you're playing in the RPG, then like, you know, you and your party has a war machine or you have four war machines and you can do there's really there's no limit like we'll write a lot of stuff but we expect people to come up with their own stuff as well and 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 it's it's infinite what you could do with them Mm -hmm. but uh, the stock options are not bad all the stock options will be good and balanced and you know we're going to do our best to make sure that the off the shelf stuff is a is a very good choice yeah and 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 because not only is it you know what you would do for quick play, but also we're providing an example of what you can or should do. So we want to make sure the stock options are all very good options, mm-hmm. and then you would adjust those to tweak your own for to to be specific for your own play style. Um. So I don't yeah I don't think there's going to be any like I, like I think yeah you, people probably will use the 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 base stock options, but customizing is definitely encouraged and it's fun like <laughs> that's where the really the depth comes in um and then uh every faction will have equipment that is exclusive to their faction um there will be a lot of equipment that is common um and then there will be like you know auxiliary units that are exclusive or common depending on the faction and stuff like that so there's just a crazy amount of options <laughs> which you can use or not use depending on, you know, how you want to play. So, yeah. Now, give now, uh, given that, given all of that, um, you get, now you guys had, you guys had set it up at, with, with a goal of 5,500 and you're currently just shy of 10,000 at the time of, at the time of this recording, you're at not 9.9, 9, um, thousand, um, with 39 days to go. Now, yep. what? Now, um, for the digital version of this, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Are you thinking um, late April, early May? Are you thinking sometime later on in the spring or early summer? What would you be shoot? What would you be shooting at? Honestly, uh, we have it listed for the delivery dates on the Kickstarter, mm-hmm. but we're hoping to have the both print and digital out August or September. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and as well as all of the models, because there are, there are 3d printing SDL files that come with this. Um, the, we set the goal, the first goal at 5,500, because that was just the minimum to just get, get this done with layout and not a lot of art. We could do it at 5,500. The 10 grand is really what we really want in order to pay for all of the art we want to put in it. That's that's and, the book that we want to make is the 10 yeah. grand book. <laughs> and and like that's that's the give us a level of 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 quality that you got in the campaign setting cuz we spent every penny of the first Kickstarter which was, you know, 13 grand. We spent all of that money on the book. We didn't take any home. Mm. We put our we put probably 3 to 5,000 dollars of our own money into developing it before the kickstarter and then when the kickstarter came through we didn't keep any of it all of it went in the book and i think i'm very proud of it but yeah art we spent a lot we spent most almost all of that money on art and then and then layout so um and of course we have to pay for layout multiple times because it you know every time every version of the book has its own layout cost you pay it again mm-hmm. so um so yeah there's a lot going on but uh yeah uh super excited about hitting 10k because that means that you know we get to pay all these awesome artists what they need to what they deserve to get be paid and we get to have some just amazing artwork and um like i we're planning on having at least 20 fully illustrated scenes so like like at the, the chapter headers in the book, you know, the, the big, these big, big scenes with multiple characters and things going on. Uh, we're going to have at least 20 fully illustrated scenes um, in the book. And then, of course, art for every mech. Every, every model of War Machine gets its own artwork on the page. And then hopefully diagrams. And then also every item needs artwork as well. Mm-hmm. So... I don't remember how many we had in the last books, but um, it was in the first book. It was a lot of items because we, uh, so, we had so many weapons and stuff. Right. And, and not all of them had artwork, but most of them did. And in this book, I want to have artwork for at least for every, every item for war machines needs to have art. So like every war machine weapon, every war machine accessory, like every single one of those needs to have its own art. And then also the units, like we need the, the tanks or the uh, heavy carriers and all of that stuff. We need art for those as well. So it's a lot. I'd probably say over 100 different like item or, you know, small art pieces, definitely over 100. So, um, yeah, like <laughs> we're not we don't we don't pay ourselves mm-hmm. um, every money we've brought every every dollar we brought in from all of this just gets recycled back into production for more book projects. Um, like we've never paid ourselves. We have no intention of paying ourselves. Like it's the, the, it, the books pay for themselves, pay for themselves. And that's, that's enough. <laughs> we just want to make really good products. And, and that's our, you know, we want people to have fun and have, you know, a quality book. That's it. Mm-hmm. And I, and, um, now, obviously, there's the potential that this could get extended through um, st- through stretch goals. But what are you shooting for as far as the page um, size? Uh, well, it's probably, probably it's very like it's going to be between two and three hundred pages. Like yeah. that's a no brainer. Mm-hmm. So it it, dep- it it there's a lot of depends. But <laughs> it, it it's it's for sure gonna be as big as the first campaign setting book. So so you're pretty much guaranteed between two and three hundred pages, and then uh, and really we just got to see how it how it how it all plays out in in both writing and layout. Uh, like so we've got like half of it done right now, half of it's written, and then um, not a lot of the conversion materials done. We have a lot of notes for that, so. The, the 5e version will be, you know, probably 10% smaller just because that's how it works out. Less mm-hmm. text. But um, our but problem yeah. is never not writing enough. We're always, <laughs> we always wind up, we always wind up uh, creeping the scope larger as we go. Um, scope and- creep is a problem for us, yes. 
and 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 writing writing extra is always an issue because we write a lot and we get into we get deeply in it caught up in what we're doing and we just mm-hmm. write more than we intended we um, try and think out all the options that people would want and then write things for everything basically. yeah <laughs> and, and like we didn't like one of the things we didn't address magic much at all in the first book because they're like low magic let's give them lots of options for running a low magic game because that's not really mm-hmm. a thing like, yeah. the, if you want to learn a little magic game, you run a lot of problems. So, like, let's make all the things to remove those problems so that people can do it. Yeah. And so we Race, spent a lot of time on that. Races now, might be a little cool. smaller this time, but class is probably going to be at least as big. And then, you right. know, we don't well, have just one faction now. We've got four more factions we have to talk adding about. Adding four more factions. Yeah. And, like, that's a lot of background work. And then... um well, we're addressing magic in a big way in this book because we didn't in the last book. So, like, we have a lot of ideas for that. So, we're going to do that. And, you know, we've got, we still have, you know, we, uh, and so we had the, the infantryman was our, our flagship class. This one, we have the, the pilot, which is kind of a gun rogue monk type of character. Um, and then, uh, and then all the magic stuff, because we're going to have at least four different magic classes that all have access to a, a singular prestige class. Um, that is very cool, and I don't want to get into that right now. Um, and then, yeah, so easily, you know, we're, uh, we're going to set our target for somewhere around 300. We'll see. Um we have we're not introducing a lot more combat systems like we did before, but then we also have one the entire one. standalone war game. So that yeah, takes one big one too. So yeah. <laughs> All right, and I I can. It's definitely something that I can see. I can see, and I'll definitely be looking forward to. Um, mostly mostly because. As as was made clear a while back when we when we here in the temple did a random mech creation and created a bunch of unholy abominations, <laughs> include including one that had, including a giant mech that ha, that had a grenade launcher that fired Moabs because why the fuck not? <laughs> why not? Yeah, I'm writing that down. Hold on. <laughs> but big big thump. <laughs> <laughs> it it's was, not a new. It it's a, not a noob tube. It's a nuke tube. It, it's a. You see that guy over there? Fuck him and everyone around him. Fuck him <laughs> and his entire town. Um, <laughs> but it's it's. But this is definitely something I'll be looking forward to because I I like me some mecha and I and I'll um. It'll cert- it'll certainly be a way to get j- to get a certain other person in the temple off my damn back about whether or not whether I prefer Stompy or Spiky Max. Why not stompy both? Stompy or Spiky? Yeah, the truth is, why not both? Yeah, that's that's right. our philosophy. Everything's on the table. Yeah, yeah. So. We tried to make sure that that everything that we're making, all the factions, are cool. Mm-hmm. Like it's not these are the ones that everyone wants to play, and, and those are the ones games. that are losers. It's <laughs> no everybody's cool. There's a reason to pick each faction. It's just a matter of taste. No yeah. bad options. Yes, it's going to depend on your play style and your personal tastes. I'd say uh, the... no bad options. I was gonna I I was gonna make a crack about that, but na- but now nah, it was too it was too easy. Um, <laughs> no no bad options. Except if you're running, if you except if you're running Godzilla, then we then I hate you. <laughs> Godzilla, um, yeah. So, man, yeah. I I can I, I hope these stretch goals go quickly. I hope we meet all of the stretch goals so that I can give all of that money to the uh uh to Ty at Darkfire, who's doing all of the 3D modeling. Mm-hmm. That's what it's for. Um, if we meet all the stretch goals, I get to pay him off entirely. He gets. He gets all of his money. We get all of our models, and um, and and we can show them off and get them out there. They're all very cool. Um, I've been holding. The, we have all the concept art done and some of the models done. I've been holding it in reserve. I've got it hidden on the uh, on the Kickstarter page, so I can't wait to unlock those and show them off to everybody. So also because I think it'll give a better picture of the the scope. 
because you've only seen the light ones, the small guys, and there's so much more. And I probably made a mistake by only showing just a small amount. I probably should have showed just how big the scope of this book is, but uh, you know, we'll get there. <laughs> so, um, one thing also, if, if for anybody listening, we have a ton of free books out there. Uh, I think there are six six free PDFs that you could download. I don't know if you've seen those already. I've I was able to go I was able to go through a, a bunch as much as much as I could, but um, obviously, I can only do so much as a one man operation. Oh yeah, I know your time's limited. Um, yeah, but part part of being like as as not well known as we are is we want to we want to we want people to see what kind of stuff we're writing because you know, you it, it, no, it speaks no, we don't have a reputation. The quality <laughs> speaks for itself though. So it, like we, we really want people just to, to dig into those free books and, and see what it's like. And if they like it, then, you know, we have other things as well mm -hmm. um, because, you know, nobody knows, nobody knows who we are. And that's probably part of the reason why we don't get, paid for anything is because there's some publishers <laughs> that would that would charge money for for those small books you know just a little bit here and there we don't want to do that we'd rather get our name out there and have people see what we're doing and then you know if they want to support us they can um yeah there's two full adventures i think one of them is like 50 pages long or 40 pages long mm -hmm. and that's yeah, we don't pdf they're and, they're free, and, but they're not cheaply done. Like, no, 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 no. They're, they're done to the same level of quality as everything else. So you know, full layouts and art, and there's a couple of them have short stories and they have maps and uh, bestiary sections with full stat blocks and everything. Like they, we've we've done all the free books to the same level of quality as our current books that we're publishing at the time, because it is a try before you buy. Mm -hmm. um, nobody knows who we are. So we want to put those out there so that people can check out and be like, oh, this is actually good stuff. I will, you know, buy their book then. And if they're thinking about it, there's something to look at for free. So um, what do we have, Adam? We have the e-tool book. Yeah. Entire, which, uh, 15 which was, a, 30 which was a, uh, April Fool's Day joke uh, that actually got us at least one customer. There's somebody who he said that was what sold him on, on our products was he saw the e-tool book, a whole book about shovels. And uh, <laughs> some people loved it. Yeah. And then what else we got? We have the um, the free books. Uh, so there's there was the, also that that there's the the players there's the recruit for orientation the, guide. yeah recruit orientation guide. We the did the voidlings. Uh, not very good. Seasonal adventure, and then we also did the holiday adventure. Um, yeah, Christmas and a Halloween adventure. Um, that's combined that's almost 100 pages uh that? and then uh there's the let's see each tool and then oh and there's the chair oh the chair i forgot about the chair yeah <laughs> uh, the chair is 16 pages about folding chairs including <laughs> uh well, a lot of art one short story a bunch of items um all all <laughs> All, all, all folding chairs that you can use in and out of combat, including magical item chairs. So, <laughs> uh, that was that was a community. That was a, a community request. Yeah, some, uh, somebody on Discord was just like, "Hey, how much do I got to pay you to to <laughs> to write me a magical folding chair?" Get. <laughs> Get Avery to draw a chair, and I'll do it. And Avery's like, I'll do it for free. And then somebody else was like, oh, I'll pitch in for more art. And then we just <laughs> started spitballing different chair ideas, and we came up with like several magical chair. chairs, several yeah. non-magical chairs, and it's you know real wrestling themed artwork. It's it's fantastic, and and it got us. It let us uh, feature another one of the player characters from our homebrew campaign, uh, which was Luna. Uh, our old DM Josh. Uh, that, was, that was his the guest. Story. His guest character, Tori Monk, <laughs> who was already a luchador. Mm -hmm. So we just, yeah, we need her using this chair. Um, yeah. If I w if I was around for that, there was one. There would be one idea that I w that I would be pi that I would be pitching very hard to get to get drawn. And um, it's probably the it's probably the dumbest idea. It's probably the dumbest idea 
in the, in this whole cavalcade of dumb ideas, and that is a Savage Company spin on the infamous throw um throw me a ch- throw me a chair spot in the in the ECW arena. You know, asking for a chair and getting all of the chairs. All the chairs. <laughs> yeah, I thought about it. Yeah, I. <laughs> hey, that could be a spell. It should be a spell, and I and I thought about it. We probably should have wrote it as a spell, but yeah, I did think about it. Uh, well, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna. Oh, is I that, unironically, yeah. I unironically house ruled summon anvil as a, as a spell once for a wizard. <laughs> Acme. So that's fantastic. <laughs> um, there there is a magic item that will allow you to summon any nearby chair into your hand just by reaching behind your back and you can pull out a chair oh oh yeah we've got so you've got a hammer space spell (laughs) a a chair out of nowhere Mm. yes (laughs) but either way i i definitely am gonna look forward to it and whatever and whatever crazy ass ideas that end up end up popping up because it's because the way you guys have this set up um crazy is not only allowed but encouraged (laughs) yeah we talk about our, our tone is action movie. So there's an awful lot of comedy, but we as authors pretend that it is serious. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly. Um, it's some, some of those stories a little bit easier than others to pretend if I were, that they're serious. If, if I were to summarize your, your tone, the best way I could put it is um, even, though, even though none of us in this call are British, 2000 AD. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I could go with that. Yeah, I mean, not, not just not just Judge Dredd, but just the whole lot, but just the whole 2000 AD line. Yeah, I can see that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's it's it's funny at times, mm-hmm. but then it is entirely serious and an action when it's time for that as well. Yeah, you can go, you know, and uh, well, yeah, and we we in the like in the operation book we talk about mm-hmm. writing our adventures. We're like, it's an action movie. You can do all these different things, but try to s- sculpt your encounters in a way that serves the action and let people have fun and enjoy it um, in a way that is, you know, cool. <laughs> so, I mean, really, you know, we're everybody's here to play a game and have fun. So we want to facilitate that. Like yeah, that's, yeah. that's the whole you're point. Not just- you're not oh, just yeah. slogging through dungeon encounters. Like we want, we want all the encounters to be meaningful and fun and 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 different. There's a lot of replayability because it's, it's some of these adventures are different every time you play them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the other thing. When it comes to writing adventures, uh, there's no no railroads. <laughs> that's a, that's another rule of ours. No railroads. Multiple paths, multiple endings, and we try to. We try to uh, script them in a way that is like a, a branching tree diagram. So you can move from point to point as you advance through a story and have different encounters and different outcomes um, so that you're not, you know, you're not stuck in any one way. You can go different directions. You can take different paths and they'll eventually arrive at a range of outcomes. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it, it helps for replayability but it also really helps for player agency, which I think is very important. It is maybe a little harder to write for, but it makes for a better game. If your players can make decisions that matter, then it makes them feel like they're in control because they actually are. Mm-hmm. Like player, To me, player agency is super important when I'm writing an adventure because I want my players to be able to actually affect the story in a meaningful way. Yeah. And I think a lot of that, I think a lot of that comes from we've all of us in, in our play groups usually sit on both sides of the table. So we're often, we're often players and we're, and we're often, you know, DMing for the same people that, you know, were DMing for us the last week, you know? So uh, having that trade off means nobody wants to make it less fun for the players because they're going to sit in that seat, you know, a couple sessions down the line. Um, and the other thing is that we play a lot of homebrew stuff. And so what's always been fun for us is that 
as DMs, we like to take player input and let that guide where the story goes. Mm -hmm. So when writing pre-written adventures, that's a little bit harder right. um, because you have to you have to have we have you have to write there down no some of what's going to happen. We can't, we, there is no give and take because we're writing this months before anybody will play it. So yeah. we have to account for options that can be made. Yeah, how do we do that on a how do we do that on a in a smaller scale, a miniature version where we're not railroading everybody, so we have kind of loose tracks and the tracks go in multiple directions. There's splits and sightings and stuff. Yeah, and um, but with with all that said, I'm definitely gonna be looking forward to what you guys have in store. I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time to out of your schedule to come on and enjoy the madness. <laughs> At in story <laughs> here. and yeah, uh, thanks for having us. And um, I look, I look for, I look. Anytime you guys want to do this again, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> uh, real quick, um, we do have those free stuff on Drive Through IPG. If you search for Savage Company, you'll find it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a Discord server that anybody is encouraged to join. If if you or anybody else wants to hang out with us or talk about stuff we often work on the books live in there mm -hmm. if anybody wants to see that kind of stuff um and then we have all of our social medias and i'll make sure you have those too mm -hmm. but yeah we definitely want to hear from people yeah and of and of course with that with that in mind a sincere thanks also goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>